I, I make it a couple of minutes past, so I think we'll we'll make a start. Um, so hi everybody, um, and welcome to our Guide to Quality webinar. Um, for those of you that maybe don't know me, uh, I'm Lauren Wakefield. I'm the Marketing and Communications Director at IOB Europe. Uh, I'm very thrilled to have you all join us today as we look to dive into the significance of quality in digital advertising. Um, to be going into the agenda. Um, so we're obviously going to do a little welcome. We've then got a nice panel discussion um, around the guide that we've produced, uh, and then we'll finish with um, an audience Q and A. Um, but just a little bit more on the um, the guide that we produced itself. Um, so we uh, released this back in February um, this year, um, and it's an updated. Um, version of our guide to quality, which is a comprehensive resource crafted by industry experts from our brand advertising committee. Um, building upon the success of the initial release of the guide in September 21, the 2024 edition of the guide encompasses additional quality elements with a particular focus on sustainability best practices. As with the last edition, the guide addresses crucial aspects such as viewability, brand safety, suitability and ad fraud, campaign creativity, user experience and privacy. Um, but to celebrate the launch of the updated guide, um, today we're here together for a webinar that will feature key contributors um, from the guide, um, including experts from our previously mentioned Brand Advertiser Committee. Um, this is going to be moderated um, by our, the Chair of our um, Brand Advertiser Committee, Ryan Martin, um, and then the panel will discuss the guide's significance, dive deeper into what constitutes quality in digital advertising and how this can be achieved. Um, we will have time after the panel discussion to answer any questions that you have. Um, we are live, so we do really encourage um, any questions that you do have for our speakers today. Um, do add them into the Q&A box that you should be able to see at the bottom um, of your screen. Uh, and Ryan will we'll share as many of those with the with the panelists um, today as we can. Um, but enough from me, I'm gonna hand over to Ryan uh, and let him dive into the content with, with his panelists. Amazing, thank you very much, Lauren, uh, and good morning, everyone. Yes, yeah, Lauren says, um, yeah, I'm Ryan. I have the pleasure of heading up the uh, IB um, Brand Advertising Committee uh, and also work as head of marketing solutions for TikTok uh, for Europe. Um, I'm very excited to really get into this um, guide for quality, really unpick some of the key points from the guide uh, and hopefully and stir up some interesting conversation amongst my esteemed panelists. So without further ado, uh, I will throw to them to introduce themselves. So uh, if we could follow the order on the slide. So uh, over to you guys. Um, I think that's me. Uh, so thank you so much for having me today. My name is Virginie Dremeau, and I'm VP Marketing and Communications International for Free Will. Um, as you can hear, probably I'm French and I'm based in Paris. Uh, and international for free will means everything but the US. But I guess that the topic for today is really across the globe. Brilliant. Thanks, Virginie. Um, my name's Emma Jarrett, and I'm the VP for Northern Europe at IAS. Um, IAS is a global media measurement and optimization um, uh, platform who, uh, who is a kind of leader in this media quality space. So very excited to be part of this discussion. Um, and, and see where we can like drive the uh, drive the agenda forward in terms of quality media. Hello, everyone. Uh, lovely to meet you all. I'm Zaid. I lead brand strategy at Pubmatic. Uh, Pubmatic, for those who aren't aware, is an independent technology company that maximizes customer value for for both publishers and buyers. Um, and yeah, lovely to be on this panel to talk more about how we can drive the future of quality. Amazing, thank you very much. So these are our runners and riders um, and let's get into it and start thinking about uh, quality. Um, so I guess, you know, the very first point to talk about is really defining quality. Quality feels like it's really evolving in its meaning and uh, how people interpret it, uh, particularly over the last few years. So I guess I'd love to start by kind of going around the room and understanding how you guys define quality uh, in the context of digital advertising and, and what are some of the key components and attributes that that, con uh, that contribute to it. So, um, Zaid, I will start with you, if that's all right. Uh, thanks, Ryan. Yeah, that's fine. So... Yeah, quality absolutely matters. And, you know, in I think in the, the environment that the ad is served in and the quality of the creative itself, the messaging will have a huge impact on, on user experience. 
Um, I think running ads in low quality environments, you know, increases the chance. And you referenced this in the guide as well in the report, you know, that the ad may be totally ignored or, or just not seen at all. Uh, you also reference in the report an A and A stat, and this is the only stat I'm going to quote today that something like 21% of impressions run on MFA sites, um, which is absolutely staggering. I mean, that's a big number. It's nearly, a, you know, a third of, of ad spend, if you think about it. Um, at Pubmatic, we talk about building the supply chain of the future. And, uh, you know, quality is absolutely central to that. In fact, it's the foundation on which we kind of, you know, build everything on. Um, and we educate bad brands about, you know, supply path optimization. Uh, and, you know, this may involve taking more control of the supply sources and identifying, you know, where some of your inventory is sourced from. It's looking at things like removing undesirable and low quality inventory and selecting partners that might offer more premium quality. Uh, so prioritizing user experience, I think, you know, and also establishing best practice can really increase user engagement. And this would definitely improve the quality of advertising. Um, lastly, I think the, you know, just reading the report, the IB also talks about uh, the ripple effect or the halo effect. I think there's been quite a few different names for this, but it essentially just relates to the consumer perception of where the ad is placed and how, you know, the user might, um, respond to sort of the brand value of of the ad um so yeah nice right, so yeah i think what we'll, i mean feel free to throw more stats our way we uh, we welcome them here so uh, if you have got any more or you think of any more as we go through please uh, please continue to share them uh Virginia, um yeah do you think the definition of quality is, is changed from your perspective Yes, of course, quality is super important. Uh, I have to say that I come from a publisher background. Uh, previously, I used to work for the um, TV advertising industry for many, many years. So yeah, obviously, everything that is described within the guide uh, makes lots of sense. But maybe taking a step back, and because free will, uh, I didn't introduce free will, but we are a technology powering video advertising um, for a very large number of premium and streaming uh, video publishers um, across the globe. And so for us, quality also would refer to ensuring the seamless delivery of the ad, uh, meaning a seamless viewer experience. And so that's also into the guide, but user experience for me and everything around ad experience is probably a very important component uh, of the quality. Um, and I guess that would be one of my favorite topic. So Probably um, the key angle uh, on what I would like to refer about the user experience would also be the ad environment uh, versus the ad itself. And again, ensuring that you are running your ads within a premium ad environment uh, is probably the prerequisite for the advertising effic efficiency. Um, and I think that guaranteeing the viewer attention and engagement uh, would be something that's super important. And so yeah. my favorite uh, yeah, in the get would be, would be this one. Nice. Yeah, I think yeah, uh, the environment is obviously so so important. And uh, Emma, just to round off uh, the opening gambit, you know, how, how do you guys define I mean, quality at IAS? Is there anything, well, anything more you can add there? Well, I guess like if you think back to where we began as a business, it was about kind of driving media quality across the industry and, and ensuring that advertisers, publishers and, and brands um, were all aware about, you, you know, about how their advertising was, you know, showing up it, uh, within the digital ecosystem. So, but I feel like we've come a long way, even, even in such, you know, a short time. So for us, brand safety feels like a concept that pretty much is embedded in everybody's kind of DNA now when they think about digital advertising. Is my brand, is my ad being seen in the right geo? Uh, is it being seen by a human? Um, is it and is it viewable? Like these are kind of the core, like the basics of what quality, a quality definition. Um, but I think where we're moving to more, you know, and we talked about, you've already mentioned MFAs, but, you know, those kind of traditional media metrics are, are, can be gained, right? Like that's the reality. So where we're really moving to is like, how do we take that actionable data and help brands and advertisers drive results with that? So quality ultimately has to drive ROI or an outcome. Um, and so I think where, where we're 
where we're moving to is slightly like new metrics. So, you know, you hear a lot about attention, but to supplement the, 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 the kind of the baseline that we, that we we're all working to in terms of the ability and time of year, et cetera. So I think for us, quality um, is also, you mentioned context, contextually relevant environments drive better quality, but ultimately drive better performance. Um, it, it, you know, we've got, we've got the stats in, in, the, in the document, but they're more, four times more memorable, and then they're driving at least 14% more purchase intent. So quality matters and quality drives performance. And I think that's kind of the critical piece here. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting point that that kind of the evolution of the definition of quality, you know, if I think back to, you know, when I started in media as a press buyer, it was, you know, can you get an advert on the right hand page of a, the right newspaper? And then to be able to continue that to still thinking about audience, but then you're able to add through technology, the advancement of technology, understanding the geo, is it being seen by a person? Is it being seen all this? And it's just, you know, the constant, I guess you'd call it raising of the floor is, is, yeah. is what's so important here. Um, it and, is. We'll, and, uh, and every, you know, the, the, we talk about you know fraudsters following the money but it's it's true right so quality we have to be ahead of the game and we have to be ensuring that we're able to provide the right metrics and information back to the industry so that we can stay um stay ahead of the head of all of the kind of uh, headwinds in the industry yeah absolutely so i guess breaking it down a little bit deeper and emma you touched on this um in your in your initial response that when we start to think about uh, the quality of digital advertising and the impact to the user. Um, you know, what what in, um, impact is being able to measure the engagement uh, proves that, like, you know, you do touch a little bit on attention. Can you talk a bit about how, you know, how you're seeing that that metric evolve? Yeah, I, I think it's like it is a hot topic and and we are seeing well, apparently 83% of people are, are decide have decided that they need some kind of attention strategy. So it's definitely an area that everybody's leaning into and, and investing in because purely to supplement, as we said, like those are like the, the more traditional media metrics that are starting to be gamed slightly. So high viewability doesn't necessarily equal, you know, quality or performance. So how do we find other other um, ways of analyzing media effectiveness? Um, and attention seems like a, a smart move. Um, the way that we've built an attention um, uh, product is kind of threefold. There's three components to it that we think are critical. So visibility. So can the is the ad can the can the ad be seen? Situation. So the environment within the where the ad is placed is critical as well. Is it a quality site? Um, how many other ads are there on that page? Um, like what? Like how does that ad stand out? Um, and then oh gosh, what's the third one? Um, so visibility situation and interaction. How does the uh, user interact with that ad placement? So do they do they scroll? Do they switch the volume on, et cetera, et cetera? And then we've also partnered with Luma because we also feel like attention really requires like that human um, human element. So Luma brings us the eye tracking. So we can connect all of those media metrics then with the human kind of uh, experience to, cre to create some sort of, you know, benchmark and, and a score for brands. So it, it gives it just gives an extra um an, an extra metric on the report so you can see all of your traditional um you know media metrics and then and then the attention score um and providing like an attention score is is critical for the creative and i think that's what version was talking about like our our job is to help you understand where the right environments are but ultimately what you put into that placement will will drive the attention score you know to the next level yeah i think it's it's such an interesting topic around, around attention and it's so easy to kind of misconstrued you know what attention means in the broader context of digital advertising and you know just hearing those three steps it's obviously a complicated thing to be able to get right but when you're able to get it right measure it effectively then it because that's when it becomes really powerful and, and we'll touch on the creative and how important that is to it um in, in just a moment but um virginie one of the things that emma mentioned in her answer there was around kind of ad load and frequency so from your perspective how how, how do you see uh you know, the kind of the management of those two um those two kind of topics uh in regards to quality yeah that's a very good question and i think it's a topic that is super important uh today and so, yeah, of course, most of the elements um, defining quality has always been the same. The 
how we can deliver result or impact um, in all aspects with transparency, brand safety, suitability, quality, experience, uh, etc. But um, I think that nowadays, with the proliferation of devices, the vast amount of content and delivery mechanisms, um, everything has become very, very complex. Uh, and that has significant impact on the user experience. And so finding the right environment, the right people at the right time, it's not an easy task, but it's not the only challenge. And I think that the new challenges uh, that are now rising are more about the delivery of the ad from a frequency and repetition uh, perspective, but also from an adult perspective and including in the video environment. Um, I think that's something that is really monitored in like traditional old media, but in digital, that's more like the wild, wild west sometimes. Um, and so I think that these new challenges really need to be addressed as soon as possible um, on top of all the other quality requirements. Um, and so I would say that for now, the fragmentation of the media ecosystem and the almost infinite possibilities um, to access the content make it super difficult for the marketers to monitor the delivery of the ad campaigns across the various devices and content forms. Um, and so the result is that it's often leading to bad advertising experience for the viewers, meaning that also, of course, that will have an impact um, of the ad effectiveness and the perception um, of the of the brand from the from the viewer. So yeah, I would say that being able to monitor um, the deliver the ad campaign across the different uh, inventories that are available is really something that is becoming paramount um, to reach the the efficiency for the for the advertising campaign. Yeah, absolutely. I think fragmentation is such a, such a challenge for us to navigate in the industry. I mean, but then I guess if you think about it from a user perception, it just means they've got more choice and more decisions about where they can make, which you know, I'm sure you can argue is both a good thing and potentially a bad thing with all the subscriptions people um, take on all this kind of thing. So it's a really interesting area around fragmentation and being able to track and measure the uh, your effective frequency to make sure you're not losing that. And so I guess, you know, we're, we're kind of painting a picture. There's lots more challenges that we have to navigate through. But I think one challenge that is consistent for advertisers, uh, as, as Emma mentioned initially, is around creativity. So, you know, what, what hasn't changed in our industry is the need to tell really creative, to create really creative advertising assets. Um, to really compel your audience to, to drive action. And if you can do that, then, you know, in my opinion, if you make a really compelling advert, then the frequency probably matters less because people are going to love to see it. I can think of, you know, TV adverts from growing up that I'd happily watch over and over again now. And, you know, if you see a good advert, you don't mind watching it a couple of times. And I think uh, key to that is making sure that you have um, adverts that are kind of fit for the platform that they're to be, to be delivered on. So um, I guess, today, from your perspective, you know, when we're thinking about that kind of creative and adapting uh, assets to different environments, how do you kind of approach that to ensure that we're able to kind of balance um, creativity with uh, quality standards? Yeah, that uh, creativity is obviously very important. And I think it's, um, you know, part of the marketing exercise that um, that brands can really enjoy. Um, you know, there's so many different choices out there at the moment. There's been companies in the past that I've worked at that have, uh, create a studio, right? That essentially with the studio capabilities <laughs> and talent that they've got, uh, they're able to take some of the existing assets from a brand and enhance them to adapt, as you've mentioned, to the platform on which the user is consuming the content. Uh, and that is absolutely key to be able to drive interaction, drive engagement, you know, um, all of the different sort of KPIs you might have on a campaign. Um, and it's more common, I think, these days as well for a lot of brands to produce content specifically for the platform they meant to run on. I mean, you, you're working at TikTok, right? Um, I think TikTok's got a saying, they don't make ads, they make TikToks, <laughs> right? Um, you know, and also with the emergence of retail media, um, I think, you know, there's there's been ads specifically created to speak to the consumers on the platform that they're running on. Um, however, it is still common. We still see that, you know, brands may take uh, a 30, sec 30 second uh, TVC or 
20 second TBC um, and run that in a digital environment. And we all know that it, you know, it just wouldn't have the same impact uh, as it does on a, on a TV screen. It needs to be fit for mob, mobile viewing. So, um, you know, you, need, you can add different elements to it as well to, you know, just make the creative uh, drive more engagement and, and just enhance the user experience. So, um, an example, you know, if, uh, if a marketer wanted to drive consideration of a brand, um, you know, you then should maybe think about having a very clear call to action. Uh, and this would allow, you know, the user to continue their journey, um, which is obviously quite important. Maybe have an end card so they can click out and go to the landing page, you know, read the benefits of the product or brand and, you know, can continue their experience from there. So my point is really that to improve the quality of the ad experience, you know, for a user, you can make really simple adjustments. Um, and at the end of the day, we're all people, you know, people respond to the messaging that really uh, reflects their personal tastes and interests. Uh, so I think, you know, you need to have that in mind. Yeah, I think it's so important to just put your audience at the, at the heart of what you're doing. You know, one of the things that I think about a lot is putting your, you know, your audience first in your strategy, what environment they're going to be consuming in, the way that they want to, you know, be consuming that in that particular environment. So I guess again, from say from your perspective, when you think about like um um when you think about kind of how agencies can foster this kind of culture of innovation um, and how they can maintain um, this focus on delivering high quality experience, what what kind of what kind of things would you be recommending to them? Right. So uh, marketers have several different aspects to think about. Right. And for me, working at a tech company now as an SSP, we talk to buyers about um, just what I've referenced earlier, SBO. Right. So having a supply path optimization strategy is absolutely important now. And it ties down things like transparency, quality, you know, selecting your inventory sources, um, et cetera. Um, the very nature of SBO really is taking control of your supply chain. Um, of course, you know, we've had the advent of Adoptex over the recent years, sellers.json that can give buyers the assurance that, you know, you are buying quality. Uh, but also buyers are looking at um, other things as well, like assessing fee structures. Pricing is obviously still a, a very important component here as well, right? They're trying to drive down costs and improve ROI at the end of the day. So, um, you know, through through things like supply path optimization, they can consolidate tech partners that they're working with. That will certainly, you know, bring down and cut costs. Um, they're able to, you know, again, improve quality uh, and the directness of inventory that they're buying. And ultimately, you know, it means that um, the bottom line really is that more of the spend will go into quality working media for them. Yeah, it always comes down back down to that bottom line, the age old. It's all, it's, all, it's all about the money. It's all it is. It's all about the money. We all yeah, all drive, <laughs> driving down costs, but still expecting the quality to be the same. That is the uh, the dichotomy that we uh, that we all live and work in, right? Yeah. Um. So in terms of you know, we talk about you know the user experience and how creativity can be completely wasted if that you know ultimately if the ad is served in in the wrong place and at the wrong time, um, for for the user. So obviously. Brand safety and suitability are huge considerations, but I guess Emma, from from your perspective, what's the, what do you see as the difference between brand safety and brand suitability? Or are they yeah. two sides of the same coin? It's a question. It's a question we get asked a lot, actually. Um, so brand safety is pretty much standard across every brand. It's it's an environment in which no no brand would want to be seen. So brand completely brand unsafe, unsuitable, fraud um, in the wrong geo. But brand suitability is, is much more nuanced, and actually that that is a very very individual um, indiv individual by brand. So what is brand suitable for an alcohol brand is probably not brand suitable a, a suitable environment for a I don't know a baby care brand, for example. And so I think. In the early days of, you know, of brand safety, we had a very blunt strategy about, you know, block lists. And if this word was on the list, then absolutely nobody, uh, that ad was not going to be seen by anybody. It would be blocked. But actually, with the way that the technology is, technology is now advanced means that we can be much more, as I said, much more nuanced and much more granular in how we decide what is uh, blocked and, and actually what is brand safe and probably brand suitable. Um, so using kind of, uh, you know, sentiment and emotion analysis, we can start to open up scale. We can start to look at, you know, the words within the context that the, the content is, is um, surfaced in and define whether that is 
uh, a positive or a negative article, for example, um, and then uh, and, and then agree with the brand whether they are happy to appear in that environment or or whether that actually needs to be is not brand safe or suitable according to their own guidelines, right? Um, and I think where this we're seeing this a uh, kind of bubble up quite a lot is when when brands are now looking to their de and i strategies and traditionally have worked on block lists and so there might be some you know more controversial words on on those lists that they're actually blocking for but that just doesn't align with their corporate goal to be more inclusive as a brand so we're working a lot with the agency world and and with with brands to help open up those lists to, to help open up scale and new audiences because ultimately like you need to be driving in inclusivity but this is also driving scale and, and performance so it's kind of a win-win on on every level so i think technology has been an enabler and will continue to be an, an enabler in that space uh in, in our opinion yeah nice no, i think yeah the advent of technology now is hopefully only going to accelerate that you know with the advent yeah. of ai and ml to really you know yeah that expert that process to help open up new corners of online and prove that there is you know, more to quality than we maybe thought before in new spaces that quality media is is able to be delivered in. Yeah, specifically with TikTok. I mean, vid video is a huge area as well. Like that traditionally had been quite hard to classify and measure. And so there's people were maybe slightly more put off about, you know, appearing within certain video environments. But actually the technology that we now have allows us to classify um uh, using advanced scene analysis to classify video content so we can be really specific about what's happening in that content to allow advertisers to have that that to make their own judgment call on whether that's an environment that they're happy to appear in or not yeah i think it's so important that advertisers are now being able to kind of have more control and influence on that and i think it's so important that advertisers engage really wholeheartedly in you know understanding what their suitability parameters are because as you say it'll be different per brand potentially per campaign as well yeah true per market so yeah market. It, like, there's so many different variables aren't there and i think it's important that people look at that and and don't have one size fits all completely yeah move away from the uh, the cookie cutter uh, brand safety approach that yeah, yeah that, that we all know and love from uh, yeah five ten years ago um, so I guess alongside brand safety, that another crucial component that we must consider is, is, um, is kind of viewability and ad fraud, which you know we've kind of touched on a bit. So, you know, how how do viewability and ad fraud affect the quality of digital advertising across uh, different channels? Uh, and you know, what strategies what strategies can advertisers um, employ to kind of mitigate some of these challenges and, and make sure that they are delivering um, effective media? Uh, Zaid, I'll come to you first. Okay. Uh, great. Yeah. Um, good question. Um, my very short answer would be working closely with your partners, right? Um, I think poor viewability can definitely lead to ineffective ad placements. Yeah. Emma's obviously talked a lot about attention um, and attention, you know, seems to very quickly become the new currency for measuring uh, performance of an ad. But if the ad, you know, ultimately isn't in view it, it it's a wasted impression um ad fraud undermines i think trust and wastes your budget at the end of the day and you know both impact really the, the quality of the digital advertising but most of all again you know it's about the money it impacts roi if there's no ROAS, there's no point you know investing in it um so to mitigate some of these challenges i think advertisers should collaborate you know with their verification partners IAS you know DV and others as well to leverage their viewability measurement you know they they have very sophisticated tools to track and optimize performance in real time uh, and you know ad fraud I would say just you know consult with, with with your ad tech partners we have a Pubmatic a global inventory quality team that implements really stringent uh, inventory sort of quality checks on all of the supply partners and publishers that we onboard into our platform. So, um, you know, we're looking at things like, uh, you know, detection of, of different types of fraud. Uh, we collaborate directly with premium publishers to help, you know, sort of uh, reduce and block invalid traffic. So there's, you know, quite a few different things and, and, and steps you need to think about. And, you know, it's obviously very important to take those steps. Yeah. I think it's, I mean, yeah, I think you, you, your the first open line is, is exactly right. It takes a village, right? You know, we said this a lot, you know, to get any campaign that it takes a village and there are some amazing partners out there that you can work with. And I think, you know, the again, the advertisers have such a plethora of choice, but it means they 
they're able to work with partners to deliver um, really compelling and exciting campaigns. You touched yeah. on, on viewability there, and I imagine, uh, Virginia, that, that's of particular importance to you uh, at Flywheel. Yes, viewability is actually one of my favorite topics. Um, and I would say I agree with you, Zai, that the first thing is to work closely with your verification on viewability partners, because that's really something that is much needed for now. Um, fun fact, exactly 15 years ago, we did one, probably the first survey in France about viewability and found out that almost 70% of the ad views were effectively viewable, meaning 30% were not. And as it seems that the standard currently is still 70% of the campaign viewable is something that is okay for the market. Um, and maybe even if the current measurement is higher than that, if we see the last surveys available in the market, it's still pretty low. And I would say that for marketers, probably, of course, it's a no brainer. You have to work with viewability measurement uh, partners, but also maybe you also have to think twice about your uh, campaign strategies. And for example, again, coming back to the fragmentation uh, of the advertising ecosystem and the inventories, um, you mentioned SPO as well, um, working closely with the sell side and the media partners is probably also very important because again, standard is great, uh, measurement is great, but it's not always reaching um, the highest level and 30% of ads that would not be viewable mean that basically they are lost. And again, if we also refer to sustainability, it's also something that is not great um, for a marketer. Yeah, absolutely. And and Emma, you you touched on um, MFAs earlier on. If you could, if you could yeah, go into a bit yeah, more, more about like, that. Then. Yeah, it's such a hot topic, isn't it, at the moment? And um, so the way that we're looking at MFAs, obviously, the way that an MFA site is created is to absolutely gain those traditional like measurement, like media metrics. So specifically viewability. So um, what we how we're analyzing um, the kind of MFA market, we're looking at those sites that are actually MFA made for arbitrage. And we're, we're, we're kind of trying to split those out from, from sites that are um, more ad clutter, because actually it, 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 if, if we can provide that information back to, to, to our partners, then it's up to them to, to, to decide whether they're happy to invest in one or the other or both or none. And I think they're not exactly the same thing because a lot of pretty decent publishers will have potentially some ad clutter on, on their site. And that doesn't necessarily mean that's a poor performing or a poor quality um, um, you know, uh, media placement. So I think where we're trying to help uh, the market is just to understand where performance is coming from and going beyond viewability. So if a site is delivering high viewability, great, but is that view is that performance then um, translating into ROI, conversions, whatever the, the KPI needs to be? And then in, in that instance, it's a, de a decision for, for a brand to make whether they want to invest, continue to invest in like MFA or ad clutter. Um, but on our analysis, we've done just like in the past couple of weeks, we, we spoke to 40 plus agencies and brands and we saw that traffic um, from non-MFA sites had a 278% uh, higher conversion and at a lower cost, which I think at a 63% lower cost per click, which it kind of feels counterintuitive because you think MFA is just like the cheap, uh, the cheap conversion, but actually the the, the when you dig into the into the the the, the data, um, it seems like MFAs aren't as well, I think that, that that in itself is such an interesting point, isn't it? You know, we touched on you know the the, kind of the race to the bottom of pricing. Yeah. Um, you can really get lured in by thinking, oh, this is a great CPM or a great uh, you know, cost per click or whatever. But I think when you look at things in a much more holistic way, you can really start to see that quality. It might seem more expensive in Italy, but if you look at yeah. things in the long run, that's where you're going to see um, a lot more effective outcomes. Which is ultimately, as a business, what we need to be thinking more about rather than just those individual kind of media metrics. Yeah. So we we create um we have a, a metric called the quality CPM and where we look at what's the effective CPM that you're paying but actually what's the quality CPM as defined by the advertiser um and we try and and try and help um or, or try and advise to, like how to close that gap right? because the more that you can you can be buying against a quality CPM the better because otherwise it's just media waste. 
Yeah, exactly. And I mean, in, in touching on um, media waste, as, as Vijay mentioned earlier on, you know, with media waste comes additional kind of carbon creation. And obviously, you know, talk of, you know, everyone's very conscious on what their carbon output is and what their carbon footprint could be. And obviously, in the latest guide, we've um, we've touched uh, and included some sustainability best practices. So, you know, it's a it's a quite a new area for lots of advertisers. So there's some really good information in there just to help people get to that kind of starting line and start to raise the floor uh, around um, sustainability. So I guess um, if I can come to you, um, Zaid, uh, if you could kind of elaborate on some of the sustainability best practices that, um, that have been highlighted in, and how these practices align with um, industry trends and uh, any environmental concerns. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to uh, comment on that. It is absolutely imperative, I think, for all brands to have a very serious strategy in place for this now and, you know, think strategically about implementing sustainability into their their business. Um, I think focus on net zero targets instead of target reduction. And this can be achieved through initiative like SBTI, which is something I've learned just a couple of months ago. And this, for people who don't know, is a science-based target initiative. Um, one of the partners that we work with at Pubmatic is 51 to Carbon Zero. And this is very much aligned with, with that ethos. And, you know, we're currently working with them to, to set these targets in place and be working towards, you know, achieving our goals for that. So, um, you know, this also aligns, obviously, with, you know, industry trends and there's growing environmental concerns around this. Plus, it also helps to make the journey towards achieving, you know, sort of net zero emissions more feasible. So that's kind of the approach that I would suggest. Nice. No, it's really helpful. It's um, yeah, as I say, it's a, it's a it's a new space that everyone's getting into. Um, Emma, do you have any kind of advice or guidance was based on what's in the uh, in the guide? Yeah, I, I think it's just a case of at least starting to measure, so you know where you're at, um, and having visibility on on how you're buying and where you're buying. Um, you know, without that information, it's very hard to kind of move forward. I think. Um, like, and, you know, IASPV, we all have kind of partnerships with the big carbon, um, you know, uh, measurement, um, uh, brand scope three, good loop. So it, it's pretty straightforward. And I would, I think that's, that has to be like step one. So if you create your baseline and then understand like how you're going to drive improvements against that, but you need to know where, you, where you're at. <laughs> yeah, I think that's it. And I think one of the, the kind of, the constant themes that's coming up in this discussion when we're talking about quality and sustainability is that there is lots of information out there and it's really up to the brand to kind of really lean in and understand uh, what tools there are available to them. And I think, you know, what I'd say to any of the, the kind of the brands and agencies in there, like th these are the decisions that are completely within your control. There's lots of partners out there who are able to, here to help you do it. But ultimately, it's for the brand to make those decisions and set those parameters and guidelines and and kind of drive that practice forward so you know we're the information is there information is power and it's just about kind of facilitating it to make those decisions it is and don't be scared like you can make incremental improvements and pretty easily so like any improvement is is mm -hmm. a step forward right so i think it's like sometimes it feels like oh god we've got this huge like mountain to climb um to make to make change but you know we we, we need to start somewhere yeah, exactly. I think that's it, isn't it? It's like all these, it's, yeah, I feel like, you know, as an industry, we're getting more complicated and more complex with the uh, new formats that are developing. There's new, you know, media channels to buy from. There's new safety standards. There's new sustainability standards. It's, it's, there's a lot of information out there, but you're absolutely right. Once you just take it step by step, work your way through it, and you can start to, you know, really make impact. And as you kind of dig into all these areas, they're, they're, they're not as scary or as complicated as they first seem. And as we've said, there's lots of partners who are here to kind of help guide you through them and help you improve your advertising experience, but also ultimately the, you know, the outcomes that you're going to see off the back of this, which is which is really the key message that, you know, from, from today, that quality uh, really helps driving um, drive great outcomes. And, you know, it's, it's, it's the ultimate lever to, to drive great performance. Um, yeah, ultimately, yeah. And SCO3 have a lot of, and, and they have a lot of um, data behind to back that up. So ultimately, you're right, it drives better performance. I do. So, just before we get onto the audience Q&A and a reminder, please do uh, drop your questions in, in the Q&A box and, and we'll come to those. Um, I just thought we'd end on a kind of a, a looking ahead. Um, so looking ahead, what are the, the kind of the emerging trends or developments in digital advertising um, that kind of might influence future editions of the guide? So when we're coming coming to the table, uh, you know, next year or the year after, what, 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 what do you think is going to be 
um, you know, changing uh, what, what our perceptions and thoughts of quality are. I'll come to you first, Eugenie. Um, I would probably say that AI is something that will um, that should help improve the ad quality uh, first from a creative standpoint because that will obviously help the marketers just to optimize the right creative in front of the right tables. Um, but also, and going back to the tech for free will, how we make the ad decisioning quicker and and more efficient um, and seamless. Um, I think that we are powering billions of ad decisions every day, and we have to do that in less than 200 milliseconds if we want to have the seamless and qualitative user experience. That, so that means that AI is probably something that will help us um, to improve that even better. Um, and also probably um, interesting developments around smart bidding. Um, I would say that would allow to do the um to decide more intelligently on the maximum creative duration on the bid requests um and how we can diversify the programmatic demand um or increase the number of ads that are eligible for certain programmatic auctions so yeah i would say that ai and smart bidings nice yeah i think that that makes a lot of sense lots of Lots of technology here to assist um, assist advertisers to help them, yeah, get better quality and uh, and better outcomes. Uh, Zaid, how about yourself? Um, yeah, AI obviously, you know, is has been spoken about quite a lot, but also um, there is growing concerns around obviously privacy and regulations coming into play, and this is always evolving. Um, you know, we we kind of at the cliff edge right now. So, you know, advertisers are talking to us about leveraging their first party data, what capabilities we have to facilitate some of that data, you know, and using things like contextual targeting, which feels like we've kind of almost gone 360 now. Uh, we've been talking about it for a long time, but I think that is just going to start accelerating. Um, and yeah, changes towards sort of privacy centric will advertising will obviously, you know, directly impact the quality of advertising and and give brands a little bit more transparency and, and really just some focus on delivering, you know, engaging ads in the right sort of environments to the right audience in, in a really compliant manner. So that's kind of my view. Yeah, I think it's interesting, isn't it? You know, that kind of full circle point, you know, there's there's lots of complex things going on in the background that we're here to kind of help master and, and guide advertisers through. But ultimately, it comes down to, you know, putting an advert in the right place and delivering a really a compelling advertisement to them, which is which is what we've been saying in advertising for, for eons and eons, right? Um, Emma, what does the future um, look like for you? So it connected to AI, but more in the create in the um, content creation space. So the where we're building for um, is is looking ahead to like the proliferation of synthetic content of deep fakes. Um, how can we analyze what is real, or what's not real? Um, so because uh, uh, I I just think it's getting so much easier like to create amazing content, and 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 the question just comes up whether you know. Again, is that brand safe? Is that brand suitable? Without understanding whether it's real or, or not, that's hard to make a, a judgment call. So that that's really one area that we're we keep we're investing with we're, we're, we're building solutions for. Yeah, it's going to be fascinating as we continue yeah. to go through seeing the different all the different ways that AI is going to completely transform the business. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think as we said, some things will stay the same, but lots and lots will change. So. Um, yeah, going to be an interesting time ahead as and uh, new definitions of quality and suitability and sustainability will, will be there to kind of contend with throughout the whole thing. Um, thank you very much uh, to my wonderful panel. Um, I'm going to jump into some audience um, Q&A if that's all, all right with you guys. Um, so um, I guess the first question is, uh, is how measurement is going to be affected by the increase in signal loss and, and the deprecation of third party cookies? Um, and does anyone want to jump in there and kind of give their views on on the impending uh, cookie deprecation? I think I think I mean just to throw my sort of twenty cents in. Um, I think we still it's still very early days. Um, you know, advertisers, brands, tech companies all coming together. We're trying to solve for the open internet. We're trying to come up with these measurements and, and solutions uh, for the future. I mean, CTV, for instance, has been out for a number of years now. We're still trying to solve for cross-channel 
measurement you know so um <clears throat> i think it, it is going to change it will evolve um there will be uh, i'm sure new solutions to come out there will be new innovations to look out for but um you know it's it's all to be had right now i think you know um the great thinkers of our industries is busy working off of this on a, on a clean script at the moment as it were you know there's there's no uh you know they, they're just looking into different types of possible outcomes into you know potential measurement solutions for, for all of it so yeah uh stick with it and maybe in a year from now it will be completely different yeah i think with, with measurement it's about looking at things much more holistically right you know i think we need to move away from just let's say looking at like that kind of last contribution, thinking about the whole the whole journey that advertisers go on, all the different touch points that they've been on, and make sure we're contributing value across that kind of value chain to help advertisers kind of see that value. And I think the way to do that is to work with some of the partners. You know, again, it, it takes a village and there's partners out there to do that to be able to look at your um, kind of uh, models holistically and work out where, the, where what's driving the real value for you and, and what combinations of of cross media is happening. So. Um, yeah, I think it's going to be an interesting, an interesting space as uh, as we all grapple with a with a new future. Um, I think this one maybe uh, for um, you, Emma. So it seems like the industry is um, from Paul Wood. It seems like the industry is uh, is still obsessed with cost of reputation, with brands focused on CPM rather than quality and outcomes. Uh, Paul's hunch is that the campaign strategies are not aligned with central brand strategies to the extent that they should be in order to drive focus around effectiveness and ESGs related strategies at a brand level what's your view I think I think your hunch is pretty accurate um and and I think I'll just bring it back to that DEI example it's incredible when we talk to brands directly and they have a very clear view on what their um what their media plan and their media strategy needs to look like but then through the kind of multiple layers that, you know, back down to the agency and their different KPIs that they're working to, and then to the actual delivery, something is getting lost in that, in, in that kind of, in that journey. And I think that's just, I think it's awareness and, and it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because unless everybody's working to the same KPIs and, the, and the, the, like those kind of core objectives, like everyone's going to, optimize to their to what they've been asked to optimize towards um so how do we connect that how do we shrink that journey how do we really connect the like the ambition at the top is actually what is delivered at the at the final um uh, when that impression is is served that is that there's some work to do i think but the, the awareness is there i think more than it ever has been so yeah that's good to hear yeah people are kind of realizing that that kind of misalignment and finding ways to yeah. kind of bring things back together um, um, from uh, uh, from Qatar, yeah, if I remember well, the pixel criteria is 50% in the case of a 300 by 250 ad unit served on a desktop. And is it the same on mobile, despite the difference in uh, in screen sizes? Um, anyone, Emma, is that one? Is that an IS question? I don't know. Sorry. I don't think I can answer that one. I'm not Sorry, really sure. No. Um, um, I, I can on. quickly comment on that. I, I think that is correct for display advertising in terms of the viewability measurement year right oh, that that yes sorry yes yeah. so this was an mrc standard of viewability and how we measure it 50 percent uh, that's a very good point that's why you know again just coming back to what we spoke about earlier attention uh you know that seems to be the new sort of currency to, to measure performance and some of the brands and you know, agencies that we talk to they look at beyond that sort of you know first second or first two second if you're you know sort of measuring video as an example we look at you know um what it looks like uh, halfway first you know two quartiles for instance and measuring viewability at the end of the video etc and also yeah uh just being a little bit more robust with that sort of measurement can can drive much better results but yeah brilliant. just if i can i think it's it's indeed the the current standard but that's also probably mean that not all viewable ads are equal uh, because of course, if you reach the standard, that's the first step, but that doesn't mean that the ad uh, will be understood or, or memorized. Uh, and so I think there are lots of researches and lots of studies about that and how you can just increase the impact of your campaign with increasing the ad completion uh, and just making sure that you will really be able to deliver the message uh, until the end. Uh, if the sound is on or off, is also something that is super important. So yes, that's the current standard, but of course it doesn't 
probably um, be represent something that is enough for the marketers to make sure that the the view is um, efficient. And actually, what we see, even if the MRC definition is X, brands will, you know, oftentimes create their own, you know, analysis and, and create yeah. their own benchmarks and best practices. So um, I think that's just the the minimum. But yeah, it, it needs to be looked at kind of more in, on an individual case, I think. Absolutely. OK, well, um, I think that is all of the Q&A's um, covered for now. So thank you um, very much for joining us. Um, final thanks to our panel. Thank you very much uh, for your excellent views and, and conversation. Uh, I've really enjoyed uh, spending the time with you all this morning. Um, and I will throw back uh, to Lauren to close us out. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, and thank you to, to um, Zay, to Emma and to Virginie. Um, lots of kind of food for thought there. And, and thank you also to the audience for engaging with lots of questions as well. Um, always good to see participation um, there too. Um, we were actually just discussing before um, we started this webinar that it is event season. Uh, and we do have some more things coming up at IAB Europe um, that you also might be interested in joining us for. Um, so first up, I believe we have um, our flagship event, Interact. Um, so for anyone that doesn't know, this is our, our headline conference that we host um, in partnership with the National IAB um, every year. This year, we're hosting it with IAB Italy and we're heading to Milan. Um, and the theme is the big questions, the sharp answers. So we're going to flip the kind of traditional conference on its head uh, and shape all of the sessions around those big questions that we have as an industry. Uh, and we'll be using the kind of content sessions to make sure that everyone leaves with actual insights and answers. Um, so do head over to um, our website to have a look and do grab your early bird tickets before the end of next week um, if you want to get them at a discounted rate. Um, and then as part of the webinar series um, today, um, that we've obviously focused on quality, um, the next one that we have in the series will be focusing on ad fraud. Um, again, this is free to register, so do sign up and join us um, at the end of the month on the 30th of April if you want to kind of dive into this area a little bit more. Um, we also have our great debate um, series um, focusing on retail media, and this is actually going to be a hybrid event, um, so it'll be hosted in Amsterdam. Um, so you are happy, uh, welcome to join us um, in person. Um, if you're a member of IB Europe, um, make sure you put your interest down um, for that. Otherwise, um, do join us virtually, uh, which is open to everybody. Um, and this is taking place on the 23rd of April. So if you want to learn more about retail media, uh, make sure you, you tune in for that. Um, and then I think this finally, um, we just have our virtual programmatic day. So we host these twice a year. Um, with this is all created by our programmatic trading committee um, and we'll focus on key topics um, in the kind of programmatic conversation um, so again if you want to join us um, to learn more um, you can register there as well um, but I think otherwise that might be it for today um, so if you do have any questions at all please reach out to um, the team 